37. You've been asked so often that you say, with tongue-filled cheek, I feel it in my marrow. You don't. You feel it in your hands, sensitive, skilled, strong, but you have a bosom that recalls their pap ladling nurses, and you smile while you talk, so it can't be knowledge. Nor do you have a blacksmith's arms. Uncanny, that's all. They've all seen the occasional calf with two heads. They'll watch you work, but you can't smoke your cigars in their club. They'll censor you with matronly tuts if you curse. And though Lord Sir Mister will beg a favour of you to set a money crippled spine, you'll never get a place at St George's. Not even Bedlam is hiring. You expect us to believe you learnt from your father what cock can bull. Bull? No, dear, really. Where are your cock and bulls? They don't listen when you compare feeling for breaks to running your hands over wood grain. Don't look into the eyes of one table fixed with pain and wait for great intakes of breath to pop joints back again. They listen to their own quickened hearts, jingle of coin, thickness of cards being left in the hall. You met one who didn't like direct contact with skin. Another closed his eyes while his sore was wrist deep in thigh. The anatomists were gleeful that day. One wanted to take you to bed, but you saw him spit bristle at dinner. Oh, cracked Sally, you're the only one that can set my bone. Fool you, fellow you took a fancy to, had his dead wife pickled at home, a drinks rest fixed to her glass fronted case. You wouldn't let a single one near you if you needed fixing. You joke too often and in company that you'd rather a sapient pig took up scalpel and mystery than any of those learned men. Um, so that's the, the first one there. <laughs> um, and talking of sapient pigs, as you do on a, a Thursday evening, I find, um, I'm going to move on to the, to the next poem, which my last collection was called The Learned Goose um, and was sort of inspired by a Georgian touring goose uh, who could do many amazing things like telling your future and who you'd marry and all sorts. But there was also a learned pig, several, and learned horses. So I've carried on the tradition and uh, this next poem is called I Was Mr. Hawes Pigman, 1817. After the thinking fool's goose, a Morocco horse of knowledge, a primer for every cup-addled man who spent his money watering cobbles and wants his fortune yesterday, there was Toby. A more sapient pig, a more genial oracle, a better humoured almanac than ever was to the public's eye. But imagine this, you are manservant to a hog, not his owner mind, his lackey, I had not the pennies to rub together to magic a pig for my plate, let alone the stage a fine figure of the porcine race. And it was me that kept him that way. Rose water rinsed, almond oil rubbed, and face farded. Mr. Hoare sold my tooth powder recipe as his own cuttlefish and spirit to vitriol, best Nash swine in England. Listened while he laboured over letters with Toby. I've never held any straight in my head nor my hand. Perhaps the public would have been more astonished to see me spell, read or cast accounts. I can discover a person's thoughts without being prodded with a stick or other cheap tricks. But it was not my due to promenade about spring gardens. And Toby was learned after all. He knew my place was beneath him. So I endured the headbutts, cloven stomps, bites and pointed squeals. I endured Mr. Hoare's clouts and talking downs, missed suppers and forgotten wages. But woes stack firmly like bricks, and raised in my chest was a wall taller than London's tower. So I snaffled handfuls of candied peel, and I lured Toby to his rightful place. I'm sure the men about town gloated in cannibal delight. How sweet to eat something so wise. Um, and then <laughs> the next one that I have for you. Oh, actually, I think Jamie McGarry is going to be quite upset from Valley Press if I don't hold up the book at some point. So there it is. With And you get these free little tatty bits of post-it note as well, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, this third one is called Staying Under. 
My mother was turned away from her neighbor's door with me in arms, though she were lonely enough to eat her own hair. But what is loneliness next to the transgression of ill wishing, the ill wishing a woman brings if she leaves her bed too soon, goes from under her husband's roof, knocks on any other than the church door, is unclean, does pollute with newborn cries and the smell of unchanged sheets. I will never be turned away like her. Nine months I've spent gathering reeds, loosening limp heather, pulling at straws, weaving a smaller roof, my husband's in miniature, that will perch over my hair like a Spanish hood, a daintier thatch that will protect their look, a twist and turn about the proper way of things, I'm sure they'll say. They prefer to bind me a bed with close walls and the stifling heat of summer lit fires, but they can't chastise the rightness out of this. I could almost have laughed at Mother Moon these past nights as I stole big bellied up our ladder, swifter than the fox that eyes my coop. Sure footed, I thin my husband's roof while stonily he sleeps. Now I have my churching veil, my saint's gable, a talisman of patched logic. I will not set foot from under roof too soon. Um, and I'm reading from um, West Yorkshire tonight, Wakefield. Um, but being in um, West Yorkshire, we're, you know, we've got Bronte country. So I thought it was only right that I should do something um, about the Brontes. And so this is a little bit of a fangirl poem um, and it's called In Search of Heathcliff. In Search of Heathcliff, I learned a few things. Ticks do not care if you are of a romantic and highly strong disposition. They will seek out your tender places. Some at least are erogenous, knee backs, groin fold and under pit. The sun will shine when you reach top withens. Though you wanted the long skirt in which you trip hiked across the moor to bluster and snag upwards in the terse wind, to be sodden hemmed and your scarf shawl too thin to contain your shivers, the day will be still, warm and dry, families serenely picnicking. When you are most immersed in your daydreams, seated on a rock among the heather, mouthing Bronte's words and your own, you will be come upon by someone you know, though not well enough to explain your strangeness. When you stretch your legs up the hill at Haworth to seek well-earned solitude with Heathcliff over coffee and thumb-brittled pages, you will see him sharing every other table even with those yet to break the spine. There we go. Um, and <laughs> I just have two more poems for you now. Um, the next um, was inspired by a commencement uh, speech that the author um, Ursula K. Le Guin gave in 1986. And um, she had a wonderful line, which was, we are volcanoes. And she was talking about the potential, women's potential. And I thought, well, that, that's just such a good line. I'm going to have to nap that. So um, this is, we are volcanoes after Ursula K. Le Guin. There may be quiet years, years when it seems they are mountains again. And mountains bring awe in their way, but you get used to seeing them in one frame. Expect them always to be the same fertile ground for footworn paths, loose soiled slopes that need mapping. There may be quiet years when the hardened crust is cool to the touch, and it seems you could dig and find only rock and ash, and maybe the fossils of more dangerous things. There may be quiet years when the plates shift a little and the mountain shakes some smoke, some heat, but life carries on the same, no urgency. Do people not know what it means when a mountain moves? There may be quiet years, but this is not one of them. And then I'm gonna finish with um, a poem which it's about my little boy Finn and um, it's probably as soppy as I get in my poems. Um, 
Equally, it can be read as a product of sleep deprivation. Um, I will let you choose uh, what that is, but um, it's called Those Hours. They were hours that passed without moment, without thought. Deep sleep ferried me across their dark expanse, or else unease tingled when I awoke during those witching hours. Hours I associated with dying or chronic unsleep. Then you unboxed them, bright, full hours, and the noises outside hinted that others knew. Those chittering birds had been keeping secrets. The sky is never really lightless. The night is never quiet. We sang and cradled while you fed and teased us with drooping lids. I missed the big canvas of sleep, I did. But now, when I wake in those hours, we hours that are yours, I wake differently, ears pricked for all the sounds of you. Then, softly, I let in the night, let it sit peacefully, leaning against me like a tired friend, as I've always let those sunful hours pull me up and whirl again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Uh, that was amazing, astonishing. Um, and just the range of, of, of subjects and emotions that you covered in, in just that short amount of time reading. Um, so I'm, go I'm going to grill you now about, about the book, because um, I've had a, a sneak preview, but everyone else uh, should go and buy it. Um, I've put the link in the chat. Um, but when you read the book, um, anyone who's, who's read it already will notice just how heavily researched it is. And what I'd like to know from you, Joe, um, did the poems come first or were the poems born out of um, reading other texts. So what was the process for, for writing the book? What was my process? That's a good question. <laughs> what was my process? Um, I mean, I love research. I really do. And if I want to get in the mood for writing, the first thing I'll do is get a really big stack of nonfiction books and work my way through. Um, and then I tend to write in response to little nuggets that I find quite quickly. And then I'll do a bit more research. In fact, if I haven't consulted an index at some point, I don't really feel like I've done a full day's work. Um, so I guess my process is sort of like a research sandwich um, with a little poem in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> nice, very appetizing. Oh, well. um, I'll go with cake, fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other thing I noticed reading the book, um, it, that your poetry is sort of marbled um, with a sense of humour and you, you de deploy it in sort of a very understated way. Um, I'm thinking of certain poems, um, Bon Appetit and Breathe, which is a really, really funny poem, uh, but like done in a, a really interesting way. Um, so um, how, how do you do that? Is the, are you conscious of that or do you just, is it a natural thing that happens? Well, this is a refreshing change because I think generally I'm one of those people who is funny when they don't mean to be um, <laughs> by accident. So you've made it sound like I've applied a skill there, Matthew, which I appreciate. Um, I don't I don't know, really. I mean, I, I'm aware that I do write about some melancholy, um, grisly things sometimes. And then my reader head will kick in and say, oh, this is a bit doomy and gloomy. Perhaps you need a bit of light in here as well. So there's, there's that. And I think also, I do write in the voices of characters and I mean, even when I write something biographical, there's still a remove, there's still like, you know, another voice. And so I think sometimes you can be emboldened to to be a bit cheekier, a bit, you know, just a bit bolder than you might be, you know, talking normally. So there's maybe that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know you in real life uh, and sort of reading the book, it's just like this is you on a page in your sense of humour, which is really lovely. Um, so um, maybe on, on to a sort of a more serious topic. So a lot of the poems in Cures are a, a stark reminder of how much work is to be done um, for the sake of feminism, especially when you read um, one of the poems is called Walter's Wife. I mean, maybe you want to explain that. Uh, again, you, you write that in such an understated way, but it's really powerful um, at the same time. Um, and there's another poem uh, called uh, Power Sale, which, which for me sort of bottles the, the era of 
of Trump and sort of um, the selfishness that was around and still around now. Uh, did you set, set out to make the book a feminist statement um, or was there something that sparked this? Um, I mean, I don't think I ever sat down and thought I'm going to write a feminist poem, I'm going to write a feminist collection, but I think I would have found it incredibly hard not to, um, because it is something that, you know, I'm very passionate about, I'm very interested in, um, as both a, a writer and a reader and, you know, as a, as a person living in the world. Um, so the, there was that, and I think um, also, you know, in terms of uh, what might have sparked it, um, what is now considered a worthy subject for a poem, I think has really broadened, um, you know, even since you and I graduated, I kind of feel like, you know, you can, you can write very broadly now. And I think that that's um, encouraged me to write about things that I'm very interested in. Um, and I think as well, I mean, the, the collection refers to a lot of amazing women writers like um, the Bronte sisters, uh, Mary Shelley, um, Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, and so they've definitely big, been, been a big inspiration and um, a lot of contemporary writers now, I mean, a lot of women writers, um, I, some of whom I knew are here this evening that, you know, I read and I just think, wow, you were writing about female experience in such a vital, um, energised way. And I, you know, I just want to grow towards that. So I think when you see something you admire, you really just want to grow towards it. Um, uh, I think probably Power Sale, which you referenced, is my most like, overtly political poem. Um, and I think there's a real skill to writing politically. Um, and, uh, you know, I've just not, I've, I've not put myself out there in that way very much yet. And that's definitely a skill that I would like to get better at. So, um, yeah, I'm always very admiring of people who can write uh, politically well. I think it's, yeah, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't think you need to work at it. I think you've, you know, you nailed it in that poem. And, uh... I, I put you alongside our illustrious guests who are here this evening. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, you, the language you use is so precise in capturing the time period. Um, it never sounds twee or a parody of, of the time. Like sometimes you do get maybe in like a period drama or, or maybe poems that haven't been worked on so much. Uh, were, were you conscious of this and, and was there a process that you went through to achieve that? Um, I do I do worry about it because I do have a bit of a, a magpie eye for like dialect words and archaic words and technical jargon and I, I do want to use it and play with it. Um, I think perhaps because I haven't got a very strong accent from anywhere and I often feel the lack of it, I'm very attracted to words that have a sort of rootedness and that convey more than like their direct meaning. Um, but I always want to sort of, you know, be careful about how I use them. And my, my main rule of thumb is that I would want the language that I use to, you know, help people into the poem. And if it stops people getting into the poem, then that's probably a bit of a failure. Um, but that's also why I'm a big fan of notes at the back of poetry collections. I quite like that so that you, know, you can have a quick, quick, quick back as well. But yeah, I, I like to play with words and, um, and have fun with them. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's what poetry is about really. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the notes in your book are just that they're a, a meal in themselves. It's, it's like a really great thing to read isolated. So it's a great compliment. They complement each other. Uh, so last last question, and then you can stand at ease. Uh, so th there's definitely an interplay of personal poems and historical uh, vignettes. And I think you, you that, that was represented in your reading. Um, was this something you planned from the beginning? And uh, if so, why? Uh, well, I have to be honest, um, Cures, the idea has been sort of eight years in the making and like five years in the sort of, you know, writing directly for it and collecting. And I did give myself quite a broad umbrella to write under so that I could sneak all sorts of things in. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, a lot's happened over that time. I've become a parent, I've moved a bit. And obviously we've all collectively been through quite a lot. Um, over the past year and some of the final poems were written and selected during lockdown so I think there was definitely um you know it, it probably has had an effect to a certain extent some of the more personal or some of the more vulnerable poems have maybe come in throughout time but I do quite like to put the historical and the contemporary together because I think ultimately the universals that we all care about haven't really shifted that much and when you put the historical and the contemporary together you can sort of see that and I find that quite comforting um, and I did want that to be an element of the collection I did want there despite the fact that I you know 
have poems about syphilis and broken bones and and um, some other things. I did want there to be like a hopeful, comforting aspect to it as well. Uh, it would have been a bit misleading calling it cures and not having anything um, of a comforting nature as well. Um, yeah, well, I, I think you've certainly achieved that. The, the book is just fantastic. Um, so thank you so much for being our, our headliner, Joe. You can sort of sit back and relax now. Uh, thank you for, for answering uh, the questions. Um, so I, I will put the link in for uh, the book in the chat um, a second time. But yeah, uh, just a final uh, Zoom round of applause for Joe as we transition into the open mic section. Uh, which means I'm sort of going to try and figure out what to do next. 